You're listening to TED Talks Daily. I'm Elise Hugh. Welcome back to the final episode of our TED Talks Daily Summer Book Club. I hope you've enjoyed these conversations and book recommendations as much as I have. And we'll be back next week with our regular TED Talk format. We've got a special treat for you today because I'm sitting here with another TED Audio Collective host, Chris Duffy. Hey, Chris. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. And tell us about your podcast for some of our listeners who might not be listening yet, but soon will. Uh, How to Be a Better Human is the name of the show. And basically what we do is we take all of the great advice from genius TED Talk people and then try and figure out how would a regular person actually put that into place in their life, right? Like, (laughs) you're so you're so smart. You figured it all out. But like, what about me, a regular person who's trying to improve their lives? How do I actually use that advice? and, And what do I do with it? Yeah, I love the premise of this show. We are about to play your episode with comedian and writer Maeve Higgins, who focuses a lot on immigration. What can you say to sort of preview the conversation? Yeah, I think something that's so interesting to me about Maeve is Maeve is a comedian. Um, She's also an Irish person who moved to the United States and looks at the U.S. with uh, kind of an outsider's eye, but then in a very unique way, not many comedians can say this, also has her master's degree in uh, immigration and migration what? studies. So <laughs> she's not just funny. She really also looks at uh, migration and the way that we see borders and nationality and who is or is not a good, quote unquote, immigrant uh, really critically and in a really interesting way, I think. And what stood out to you about the talk? Well, for one, she's talking about really serious issues, but she's mm-hmm. also hilarious, right? Like oh, that's, great. I think, a beauty of comedy is that you can see uh, problems in the world from a from a way that doesn't just make you want to shut off and uh, go live in a cave for the rest of your life. That's fantastic. And this is our summer book club, of course. So we are pairing your interview with a novel that you love called There There by Tommy Orange. Tell us a little bit about There There. So this book, There, There, it it really reads like an action movie. There is so much going on in this book. And yet, while it's this action movie following 12 different Native Americans living in contemporary Oakland, California, in and around Hmm. the city, it also Mm -hmm. has these essays about what it means to be American, what it means to be Native American, Mm -hmm. how the United States has treated its different populations over the time. So it's like the, the best action movie and also one of the smartest sociological and historical essays paired together. That's what I love about this book. Great pitch. The reason why I thought these two paired really well is I think There There is really interesting in the way that it makes you look at contemporary uh, America and the contemporary United States differently. For me, Mm. it really made me see the way that Native Americans living in uh, urban places, how they live and how that is not uh, a thing of the past. It's very much a thing of the present. And these issues are still unresolved. And I think one of the things that I find so interesting about Maeve is she really challenges us to see borders and immigration, not just as uh, pieces that are set and they have to be this way, but really as um, things that we can imagine differently and see differently, and that that could be a real way to change the way that we look at borders and nationality and the way that we treat people all over the world differently. And I think there there kind of has that same idea about how none of these issues are set and fixed and solved. Great tee up. You're about to listen to an episode of How to Be a Better Human featuring host Chris Duffy in conversation with writer Maeve Higgins. You are listening to How to Be a Better Human. I'm your host, Chris Duffy. And today on the show, we're talking about comedy and immigration. Now, those are two topics that you probably don't think go together. But our guest today, Maeve Higgins, is a comedian and an author who moved from Ireland to the U.S., and she's made a career out of using humor to get people to see borders and migration differently. You know, in general, one of the things that I love most about comedy is how a good joke can take something out in the world that you've noticed but maybe never fully articulated to yourself. And then a comedian comes along and their punchline makes you laugh, but it also crystallizes the way you see that thing, and you can never see it the same way again afterwards. In Maeve's comedy, she tells her own experience of leaving home, and she uses jokes to complicate the narratives that we sometimes hear about immigration, particularly the idea that there are some immigrants who are quote unquote good and others who are quote unquote bad. Now, I'm I'm really kind of analyzing Maeve's joke a lot here. And as E.B. White once said, explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. You understand it better, but the frog dies in the process. And so... In the interest of not killing any more frogs, I'm going to stop talking and just let you hear from Maeve herself. Here's a clip from her talk at TED Women. I won the Alexander Hamilton Immigrant Achievement Award for contributions to Manhattan and New York State. Thank you. 
So Alexander Hamilton himself was an immigrant and all he had to do was set up a banking system, help to win the War of Independence and generally found the United States to be considered a good and welcome immigrant. That's a lot to live up to, you know. I can't even remember my online banking password. Actually, I just remembered, I think it's actually Hamilton. I love that joke. I really admire Maeve's work and I always love getting to spend time with her as a person. On today's show, we're going to get more into Maeve's comedy. We're going to talk about her writing and we're going to talk about why she decided right as her movie acting career was taking off to get a master's degree in migration studies. Not the typical path for a movie star. We're talking comedy and migration with Maeve Higgins. Hi, I'm Maeve Higgins. I'm a writer and I'm a comedian. I live in Brooklyn and I'm from Ireland. Um, So Maeve, you are a comedian, but you often talk and you've written a lot about immigration. That's obviously not the, mm-hmm. the that's not the thing that you see at every open mic around the city. So <laughs> how, how did you start thinking that you wanted to take such a serious issue and, and find comedy in it? I suppose it came from my real life, like, you know, how, how us comedians do that. We just experience something and then it kind of just transmutes itself into our comedy. But I think um, obviously I became an immigrant myself around 10 years ago. And I grew up in Cove, Chris, which is, of course, yeah. um, you know, it's like a small island on the south of Ireland, but it's where a lot of um, emigrants left from in like the worst years of Irish history. I mean, 200 years ago, like well before I was born. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I grew up knowing a lot about um, people who left and I didn't really think about I suppose like about where they went or what it was like on the other side until I um, had, you know, a very different um, experience of migration myself. So you came to the U.S. on a special visa, which I know because we were friends and you were in the process of applying for it. And you had to kind of prove that you were special and unique as an artist. That's literally the name of the visa. An alien of extraordinary ability. <laughs> yeah, it's the O-1 visa. And um, it's for people who do things that are, you know, extraordinary, supposedly. So that's artists and um, sports people, professors, um, like if you win an, a Nobel Prize or something. <laughs> but, but, but an interesting thing to me is, you know, I, I know you've made a lot of jokes about the fact that you have a legal document that says you are extraordinary and have extraordinary abilities. But you've also mm-hmm. questioned the idea of like, should we be ranking immigrants in that way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. And And, you know, that kind of came to me as a sort of, hmm, okay, I can see how lucky I am because I know myself what I contribute. (laughs) I would (laughs) say it's the most valuable. And I'm not being like self-deprecating for the sake of it. I genuinely think, oh, you know, an astrophysicist like sitting in a refugee camp who could potentially be really uh, doing some great work. Meanwhile, I'm kind of like, Uh, working on my a five minute bit about like a date that went badly or something. (laughs) Yeah, well, uh, uh, here's a real thing that happened to me recently. I went to the TED conference Mm -hmm. and I talked to someone and this person runs uh, an international nonprofit that stops child trafficking. And then he heard what what I do. And he said, oh, wow, comedy is so important. And I started laughing because I thought that's obviously a joke. And then he was like, why are you laughing? And I was like, oh, (laughs) it's absolutely not important at all. What you do is important. I'm a clown. But um, (laughs) but I suppose even that kind of that gets us a bit sidetracked, because I think the ultimate thing that I realized is that, you know, if you start dividing like humans up into like who deserves to be where and like who's allowed to move across borders, then it gets really ugly. Um, I know that there have been times where you have maybe questioned whether you even are a a comedian. And and obviously not that you couldn't be a comedian, but you've thought like, is that how I want to define myself anymore? Well, I do a lot of different things, you know, like um, I, yeah, study and I write and I do comedy. I've kind of come to terms that like I just do a ton of things and and sometimes I act as well. Um, And so, but yeah, like comedy to me means somebody who's like going on the road and like, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. I just suppose I didn't really feel like, especially when I was coming up in comedy in my 20s, it was, you know, very male, very, and not just male, but like very macho and uh, kind of chauvinistic. And um, 
I just didn't want to be part of it, but I also did want to like make jokes and be funny and like travel around. So I have a hard time identifying with comedy, but these days I'm older and I live in New York and I do this show every week and there's like so many interesting, fun people from all different perspectives, you know, um, just like, I don't know, queer people, you know, people who've been like historically excluded from comedy stages and um, disabled people, just like every type of person. And that's what I'm interested in now. And that's, I feel like a bit better now about being like, yeah, I'm a comedian. I'm not like ashamed of it. <laughs> hmm. So, you know, I know you were talking about how you have some skepticism around comedy's role to to change culture and society mm. and, and especially political realities. Um, if comedy doesn't really move the needle in the way that you originally thought that it might, what does it do? What does comedy do? I think or what can it do? P potentially comedy can be um, like it, in the way all I suppose art can be or creativity can be as a form of self-expression, right? Where I'm saying to you, this is how it is for me. Like, this is how I see this thing. And I, and I somehow transmit that to you. And then you can see how I see it. And then that might resonate with you or you might be blown away by how different it is than how you see it. But it's a form of self-expression, which I think is very valuable because I think, you know, if we're denied that, we're denied a part of our humanity to make it very serious. Um, mm. And so I think a form of self-expression is wonderful for that. I think, too, it's a really good uh, release, you know, like when you have a good laugh with your friends and like it's I think it's like very well documented that children laugh a lot more than adults and like it just relaxes you. It's very it's, mm. it's a real relief. And also, I think comedy um, gives you a feeling of community because when you're laughing all together and this can be um, good or bad, you know, like yeah. you can all be laughing at one person and that joins you up against that one person. And that's not a great feeling for that one person. Like comedy can be, certainly be weaponized, but it's definitely a form of community where you kind of say, OK, we all feel safe enough in each other's company to laugh at this one thing. Um, you've done a lot of thinking about borders and migration and the way that people move. You've thought about it in ways of how to make it into a punchline. You've thought about it in ways of making it into an essay and you've researched it in terms of actual policies. I think it's interesting to me that you have this Irish experience because in, in the US, many Irish politicians, or I should say Irish American politicians, kind of valorize their mm. ancestors as like, those were the good immigrants. But then now the people who are immigrating today, those are not the same as your great, great, great grandfather who came mm -hmm. over from, from Ireland. Um, and, and I wonder how that plays out in your experience as someone who's looking at immigration, but is also from the place that critics of immigration kind of are proud to be from. It, it's so discombobulating. I remember Mike Pence is kind of the clearest example. There are plenty and they're on the Democrat side and they're on the Republic side. But certainly Mike Pence, who tried to ban um, Syrian refugees from, I think he was the governor of Indiana and at the time. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, went on to, you know, help the Trump administration enforce all of these horribly xenophobic immigration policies. But yeah, Mike Pence loves to talk about his Irish grandfather who like moved over from Ireland from a place called Mayo um, back in the day. And you know, he, he also was fleeing a civil war and he also was literally just trying to like um, get a better life for himself and his and his family, you know, so you could say he was a refugee, mm. you could say he was an economic migrant. Again, those categories can be pretty um, dangerous because people slip in between them all the time. What can a person do if they are living in a country that is a place that people are trying to migrate to? How can they actually think about borders and migration differently or, or maybe even take action? So I would encourage people to um, Remember to use your imagination and to understand that you already are using it. <laughs> so to see, to look at a border and think like, wait now, like who said it's there? And, you know, in so many cases, it's because of violence. It's because of war. It's because of white supremacy that borders even exist in the first place. Um, certainly, you know, you go to Texas and you see that there's like been hate crime against like um 
you know, Latino immigrants. And it's like, but this used to be Mexico not that long ago. <laughs> um, you know, say, oh, the there's a lot going on in the Middle East. Well, like, just look back not just about 100 years ago when it was like European men with like a ruler and a few pens decided where everybody belonged. Well, so it's interesting. I mean, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it seems like one of the things that you're saying is that a big piece of thinking about immigration and thinking about borders is the creativity to imagine them differently. And, and that actually makes me think that the role of people who are not just policymakers, not just nonprofit leaders, but also people like you who are creative, who are funny, who are writers, you don't often think about those people as being able to, or at least I don't think about those people as being able to affect big changes. But if I'm hearing you correct, one of the big things that we can do is also to just not accept that this situation is unchangeable. We can imagine a better situation. Yeah, absolutely. We can imagine it and then um, and then take steps to enact that. Yeah. So, yeah. so talk to me about the mm -hmm. steps, right? So one piece is imagining it. What are some of the, the concrete steps that you think a, a regular person can do? So I think to uh, educate yourself is really important and to see, oh, at the moment right now in the UK, um, they've started to outsource their refugee processing um, facilities to Rwanda. So you arrive, you try to get to the UK, you get sent on an airplane to Rwanda. And mm. that's just copying the Australian model, which, you know, didn't let people touch Australian soil. They put all the refugees for processing um, on islands belonging to Papua New Guinea. And so I think taking an inactive role in fighting against that. And, you know, those are the usual steps. I think it's showing solidarity with the people who are working against this. If I'm thinking, oh, wait, like there's all these like single mothers living in um, this immigrant neighborhood near me, who happens to be Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Um, I wonder like how they're doing in the pandemic. I can literally Google that and see that there's an organization working there helping single parents in Sunset Park. You know, so don't think that you have to go out of your way to do a huge start something. You will probably find um, people who are already helping and then you can support them in whatever way you want. That could be, I mean, I'm like a comedian, so I could do a show for them. I could donate money. I could raise awareness, that tricky word. And also just mm -hmm. to jump in there is I, I think that a key part of finding organizations that are already doing the work around this is it can also help you to avoid being the, you know, the savior mm -hmm. who parachutes in. And I put that with the big quotes around savior, right? Of like, I can do it and I am going to help these people who are helpless and they can't help themselves. Instead, right. <laughs> there's probably an organization that's doing really good work and you can lend your support to them rather than thinking like you have to reinvent the wheel for people who may not even want the wheel reinvented. Yeah, exactly. And like different, especially if you're, say, if you're in the US or if you're in the UK mm -hmm. and you're you know, thinking, I want to help arriving immigrants. I want to help um, arriving asylum seekers. We've had lots of Afghan refugees moving to the US recently. They're going to have completely different needs than, you know, a family arriving from Ukraine who maybe have cousins here. Um, and so you need to check in. Like you need <laughs> to check what do you need? How can I help you? It's not a kind of a, as you say, like a, a savior thing. We have been talking about the way that comedy can impact and shape the way that we think about immigration with comedian Maeve Higgins. And here's another clip from Maeve's TED Talk. Immigrants are actually less likely to commit crime than people that are born here in the U.S., which is why I have my purse just tucked behind that. Um, <laughs> I don't trust you. Um, no, I do. But, you know, we're more likely to start a business and we contribute to the economy and we really enrich the community in lots of other ways, too. But truly, I believe that any measure of an immigrant's worth is dangerous territory. I honestly, I think it's so stupid because dividing people up by what you think they're worth, it's not just unethical, it's like it's unscientific. Because I got into America, I'm safe here, but honestly, the most I contribute is like too much money spent on cold brew. I, it's so expensive, but I buy it every day and I buy another one. $7, no problem, here you go. My heart doesn't quite feel like it's exploded yet, so I'm going to need another cold brew. Annie Moore never made a fortune. She never wrote a book or invented a computer. And really, why should she? Why should immigrants have to prove themselves extraordinary to deserve a place at the table, to deserve a fighting chance? 
So your latest book is called Tell Everyone on This Train I Love Them. And I, I truly am not just saying this. I love the book. I thought it was so funny and moving and it threads the needle between comedy and uh, serious analysis of immigration policy in a way that I just don't think anyone else has really done. So how did you come up with the idea for the book and what was the process of writing it like? Yeah, well, I, I first of all, I would say like, immigration stories are this is from like a kind of a you know very like i write for a living like it's a very writer point of view uh -huh. they're so interesting to me because immigration stories by their nature they have like a beginning and a middle they have a journey they have like somebody changing worlds and like when you speak to immigrants or the children of immigrants it, they often have this like really fascinating glimpse into two different realities, you know? Well, here's one thing that I, I remember that is a personal story <laughs> that I've always laughed about is one time you and I, I mean, we met in the in Boston and in New York, so yeah. in big northeast cities. But one time we were doing a show in a kind of semi rural area in the Midwest um, and our, our hotel was next to a big box store. I think it was a Walmart. And I remember that, that I asked you what you were doing. I was like, oh, hey, what are you what are you doing? You want to hang out? And you're like, I'm just walking through the parking lot. It's so enormous. I've never seen a parking lot this size. I have to take photos to send to my family, <laughs> which, which I get it. That's so funny. But to me, it was like, yeah, of course, it's just an enormous parking lot. But you were like, this is the most American thing I've ever seen. I do think that your work is evidence that comedy can bring attention to things that are not paid attention to as much as they should be, or it can shine a focus in places that people would maybe prefer not to look. And when you get them to laugh, all of a sudden they see it in a way that they would have glossed over it otherwise. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that would that's, you know, that would be wonderful. But yeah, I suppose one example that I did write about in my book was when I went to visit the Border Security Expo. And, you know, that isn't something that most Americans or, or really anybody would go and visit. It's something that um, immigrant rights activists can they tend to protest, but they're outside. But, you know, I had a press pass and I went in and I just watched and I took notes and I talked to people and um, I suppose I had my own take on what I saw there. And it's it, it's this big annual event where it's kind of like the uh, the government and the industry around um, border enforcement and around immigration policy. They meet every year. And it was just fascinating to be there and to have this kind of outsider's perspective. I went there and they raffle off homemade rifles. And of course, I was so fascinated by this. Um, and then I guess some of it was pretty comical. And then other parts of it were like so kind of frightening and serious. Um, but that's what like, Chris, that's what um, I think telling a full story is too. Because often I think immigrants are kind of either sold as, you know, uh, criminals and a danger and a threat and oh, what's going to happen with the climate? They're all going to arrive. Or they're sold to us as victims, you know, like, oh, this poor family, these poor babies, you know, this kind of strange infantilizing. Or the third category is like, immigrants are good. Look at all the work they do. Like, look at them picking all of our fruit. And I would say none of those categories are, you know, there, there could be some truth in all of them, but none of them are the full truth. So I think a good way is to remind yourself, like, wait, like, look at all the parts of me, you know, like, look at what I do, what I think, what I feel, who I am. Immigrants are exactly the same. There's like huge complexity in each person. So I think resisting um, very simple stories about immigrants is, is one thing that we can all do without that much effort, really. It's just kind of resisting what we're fed. One thing that I know about you from knowing you as a person and also is so crystal clear in your writing is that you take such joy from meeting people from different places and different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, um, what are some of the the favorite moments or the favorite people that you've gotten to talk to in the course of, of writing your books? Oh, so many people. This one little girl, she was 10 and I met her. I, I was interviewing her down in Richmond in Virginia because I was talking about like, for one story in my book about these, what we do with statues in Ireland of former colonizers, the English. And like Irish people have had like a really crazy time with statues and monuments at home. 
mainly just like blowing them up but like <laughs> as a party like everybody gets together on the street and the army's like stand back <laughs> and we're gonna blow this up and it's like very kind of fun um it's officially blown up it's not like yeah. a, a an unofficial blowing up <laughs> and so i was kind of you know, writing about the history that we have with monuments and then, you know, the the very current, you know, extremely urgent kind of questions that Americans are diving into. It's causing all this kind of anguish and also hope. So anyway, I was chatting with this this little 10 year old down in Richmond and she was just wonderful. Chris, she was just like, yeah, I my dad brought me to the um you know, to to Monument Row that they have down there. They've since been removed. But of course, there was the big Robert E. Lee statue that when the Black Lives Matter movement came up, they took it over and they projected on it and people could scribble on it and uh, do graffiti on it. And she was just like such a cool child. And she was like, I went there. It was really nice. Like they were giving out food and water and like I got to spray with my spray can on the foot of the statue and to her, this was like a very, I think, going to be a very solid memory, you know, of when she was allowed to own the place she lived, where she was allowed to kind of claim the space around her, whereas before it was all cordoned off and it was this big, insanely big statue overseeing the city of like somebody who thought that people like her, she was a black girl, should have been kept in slavery. So, but she wasn't, this didn't feel like heavy or sad. It was just like, an experience in her day, you know, just before she went to play like computer games and like have a barbecue with her family. Like it was it was just like another moment in her life. And I think um, that's really important to capture when you're talking about um, big and sad and historic things or like larger ways that society operates is to like go small. And I remember too, um, talking to for my podcast, I, I interviewed an Iraqi um asylum seeker he actually came over here on um a special immigrant visa which is for people who assisted the u.s army when they were you know in their various jaunts all over the world and (laughs) doing their various illegal wars (laughs) and so he um he was here and he was really you know heartbroken because he could not go back and so he was away from his family and he was um he was away from everything he grew up with. He was making a new life in Seattle. He was also a queer man. And again, that would make him very unwelcome at the time. ISIS were in control of large parts of Iraq when I met him. And, you know, I got to his apartment and he was in the middle of making a mermaid costume. He was like, okay, I'll just be too sad. Like, you know, I'll be right there. There's some sequins missing from the tail. (laughs) And it was like these moments of joy and connection that are in everybody's life, I think are really important to include in stories of, you know, um, pain and stories of borders and the the way uh, things cross us when we're just trying to live our life. It's so... uh, it's so lucky that I get to see it from both sides, you know, and it's so wonderful that I get to kind of piece these little bits of history together. The first the first girl through the first immigrant through the gates of Ellis Island, you know, I wrote about her, Annie Moore, her name is. And um, she left from my hometown. And now there's an, a, there's a statue of her in Cove, my hometown, with her two little brothers. Um, and then there's a corresponding statue of her on Ellis Island because she, you know, she was the first one there. And, you know, when you think of her, she was an unaccompanied minor, basically. She was undocumented. Uh, she was traveling, hoping to be reunited with her parents who had moved here to the States, you know, a couple of years before that. She was looking after her two little brothers. Like, amazing, you know. And she she was walked in. She was given a gold coin. She was celebrated. Um, you know, that was in 1892. It was very different than, you know, those teenage girls right now. Um, at the southern border who are absolutely entitled to apply for asylum who are being kept out. What are three things that people listening can do to think about immigration and borders differently or to make positive change around immigration and borders? Definitely inform yourself is one thing. I know myself, if you have a passport and you have citizenship, you're not going to need to think about um migration but it's really worth it like figure out okay why are your borders there who's making the rules around them um and why that is and why historically and why right now so i think inform yourself about america's past and present with 
immigration laws and then look at like who they impact day to day. And I think reaching out to um, immigrants and asylum seekers can seem a little bit daunting or you might think, well, like I'm not from that community. They don't need me around. But actually, it's really been proven that something like community sponsorship, um, which the US is just now starting to do again, um, they can sponsor immigrants as a community, not just families bringing each other over. Um, that's very successful way of integrating new immigrants into into society. Um, the more contact and the more connections that a new um, migrant has with people who are already there, then the more successful their um, their life is going to be here. So reaching out in, in whatever way you can, that could be like through your kid's school, that could be through, you know, a local immigration organization uh, or through a church or through your synagogue. Um, again, you'll definitely find people who are already working on this. I think the third thing to do is when you're hearing about or reading about uh, migration, you'll notice it comes in all these different um, forms. So you might be reading about climate change and then they'll say, there's going to be like, you know, four million climate migrants coming from, you know, the global south to here. I think uh, question that and do your own homework on that. And then as well, if you're reading something or you're watching a movie and you, and it's just relentlessly bleak and it's about, you know, um, a migrant, this could be during World War II, this could be right up to today, it could be a news story or a fictional story and it's just bleak and it's just sad, just understand that they're leaving something out of that too. They're le if they're leaving out any bit of humanity or any bit of joy, uh, any bit of levity, then that's not the full story. So I think look a bit harder at the immigrant stories that you're presented with. And if they're all pain or they're all joy, then they're probably not accurate. Hmm. How are you personally trying to be a better human right now? I'm trying to take it easy a bit more. Um, my niece said one day, I said, what are you going to do today? I'm going to have a relax. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I've been trying to deliberately not feel like I have to produce something every day um, in order to like uh, be a worthy person. <laughs> mm. And so it's tricky because um, my worth is kind of tied to like my output. So I'm trying to take it easy. And by take it easy, I mean cook, have my friends come for dinner, um, go for a walk, have coffee in the park instead of sitting in front of my laptop. Very small things. Um, okay, and then last question. What is something that has made you a better human? It can be a book, a movie, a piece of music. It could be anything. Hmm. Oh, I know a quote that I heard the other day from this professor called Ruha Benjamin. And... I did like a talk with her about borders and she was amazing. Um, but before that, I looked on her website just to be like, oh, I wonder who I'm going to be like on a panel with. And she has this quote on her website that blew my mind and I'm trying to hold on to. It says this, remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. Hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, that, because it's like... It it's so easy to say like what's wrong with everything but uh, and it is important to like rip down things that are like horrific and oppressive but it's also really even more important to build up things that you believe in so that like there will be a better place to go when we do finally get rid of this one i i feel like that perfectly sums up everything that we've been talking about <laughs> and, and the goal for what uh what I take away from your work around migration is to build that new world and to tear down the bad one. Well, um, Maeve, thank you so much for being on the show. Aww. Maeve Higgins, author of Tell Everyone on This Train, I Love Them. Thanks, Chris. That is it for today's episode. I am your host, Chris Duffy, and this has been How to Be a Better Human. Thank you so much to our guest, Maeve Higgins. Her latest book is called Tell Everyone on This Train I Love Them. I can't recommend it enough. Buy a copy. On the TED side, this show is brought to you by international dream teams, Sammy Case, Anna Phelan, and Abhimanyu Das. 
From Transmitter Media, we've got producers of extraordinary ability, Wilson Sayre, Leila Das, and Farah DeGrange. And from PRX Productions, they're the best in the world, Jocelyn Gonzalez and Sandra Lopez-Monsalve. We will be back next week. Thank you for listening.